Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Eduardo Matos Moctezuma lecture to be delivered by Mexico's distinguished writer, Juan Bioro. I'm David Carrasco, the Neil L. Rudenstein Professor of the Study of Latin America in the Harvard Divinity School and Department of Anthropology. And I serve as the director of the Moses Mesoamerican Archive located in the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. Five years ago, I had the idea that Harvard University should establish for the first time in its nearly 400 year history, a lecture series that would honor a Mexican scholar whose contributions had a universal value to the world. The first name that came to my mind was that of the universally renowned Mexican intellectual and archeologist, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, famous for his superb leadership in the 40 year excavation of the great Aztec temple in Mexico City. I thought that a lecture series focused on Mexico's contributions to world knowledge through Eduardo Matos Moctezuma would increase Harvard's knowledge of Mexican history and culture, strengthen the ties between our university and Mexican cultural institutions, thereby giving our students and faculty new educational experiences and intellectual resources. Fortunately, this plan was endorsed and supported by our school's David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, and especially its Mexico City office, directed by Mauricio Benitez. The Matos Moctezuma Lecture Series is also supported by the Harvard Divinity School, led by historian and dean David Hampton. I'm happy to report that the intended goal of this lecture series has been fully accomplished. Each year, the lectures are delivered in both Mexico City and at Harvard, where we have heard powerful presentations by some of Mexico's most distinguished academics, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma himself, anthropologist Alfredo Lopez Austin, historian Javier Garcia Diego, and art historian Diana Magaloni. About 3,000 people in both Mexico and Cambridge have attended these lectures in person. Countless others have attended the lectures remotely, watched the videos, have read excerpts of the lectures in the newspapers, or seen them on television. The story and plan came to fruition through the financial generosity of the Mexican businessman, Jose Antonio Alonso Espinosa, and his wife, Karen Beckman. And I extend a warm word of gratitude to them. Adding to this binational educational work has been Harvard's own faculty members who re whose research in Mexico include archeologist William Fash, linguist Maria Luisa Parra, and historian Gabriela Soto La Viega. I also thank Charlene Higby, manager of the Mesoamerican Archive, which plays a central role in the series. It must be stated that the Eduardo Matos Moctezuma lecture series has also drawn interest and support from our Latinx and especially Mexican American community. A symbol of this is the stunning painting done by the Chicano artist, George Yepes, in honor of Matos Moctezuma's career and what he has come to mean to the Mexican American community in the US. Here you see an image of the painting entitled El Guerrero Aguila. In closing my remarks, I extend a warm welcome to all of our viewers tonight and am pleased to introduce to you Jane Pickering, the William and Muriel Seabury Howells Director of Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. Jane was previously Director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, and we have all benefited by her leadership and support. Please welcome Jane Pickering. Thank you, David. It's an honor to speak after you as we once again dive into this remarkable lecture series and its vital purpose, as well as introduce our distinguished speaker. But first, I would be remiss, since he couldn't introduce himself, to let our viewers know that Pro Professor Carrasco is a world-renowned historian of religions with a particular interest in Mesoamerican cities as symbols, 
and the Mexican-American borderlands. His many accolades and honors include the Mexican Order of the Aztec Eagle, the highest honor the Mexican government gives to a foreign national. He has been the driving force behind this marvelous lecture series, as well as being a passionate advocate in furthering Harvard's connections with Mexico and a champion of the Peabody Museum. I'd also like to add my thanks to the David Rockefeller Center the Harvard Divinity School and the Moses Mesoamerican Archive for their collaboration on this series, together with offering special appreciation for the generosity of Jose Antonio Alonso Espinoza and Karen Beckman. The Peabody Museum is privileged to steward one of the world's premier archeological collections from Mesoamerica, a result of excavations and collaborative research over many decades. It is also central to our mission to support educational programs that serve a broad public audience. This includes our 10 year collaboration with the Mexican consulate and community in Boston on our vibrant Day of the Dead celebration, our much loved K through 12 programs that explore ancient civilizations, and of course, participating in this celebrated lecture series. The museum is proud to be part of this tremendously important initiative. It is now my pleasure to introduce Stephen Levitsky, Professor of Government and newly appointed Director of the David Rockefeller Center at Harvard. His research interests include political parties, competitive authoritarianisms and democratization with a focus on Latin America. Since 2004, Professor Levitsky has published five significant books on these topics, including with Daniel Ziblatt, How Democracies Die, which spent many weeks on bestseller lists. He is currently engaged in research on the durability of revolutionary regimes and problems of party building in contemporary Latin America. Please join me in welcoming Professor Levitsky as he introduces Mexico's premier archaeologist and public intellectual, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. Muchas gracias, Jane. Bienvenidos todos a este maravilloso evento. Es un placer en uno de mis primeros actos como nuevo director de, Doc, de David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies in Harvard presentar al titular de este ciclo de conferencias, el muy distinguido arqueólogo mexicano Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. En el México actual, el profesor Matos es considerado un tesoro nacional, gracias a su gran liderazgo en la excavación del gran templo que funcionaba como centro ceremonial del Imperio Azteca en la actual ciudad de México. Bajo su dirección, en una investigación multidisciplinaria de más de cuatro décadas, ha resultado en una enorme cantidad de descubrimientos, en particular sobre el carácter del urbanismo mesoamericano y la integración del comercio, la tecnología, la religión y la jerarquía social en el mundo prehispano. Su trabajo intelectual como arqueólogo, profesor, escritor, asesor de académicos y estudiantes ha resultado en la publicación de más de 1,200 libros, artículos y guías sobre el mundo azteca, sobre todo escritos por investigadores mexicanos. En las palabras de mi colega David Carrasco, el papel de, del profesor Matos como comunicador a la nación mexicana sobre los descubrimientos del Templo Mayor le ha convertido en el equivalente moderno de Tlatoani Azteca, es decir, el orador principal, el que cuenta las historias que necesitamos oír. La comunidad de Autoclass está muy feliz de recibir de nuevo al maestro Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, quien por medio de su mentoría de nuestro querido David, se ha convertido en gran amigo de Harvard. Como director de Autoclass, quiero apoyar esfuerzos como este, que encabezan el, el, los profesores Matos y Carrasco, que unen lo mejor de Harvard y México en la exploración conjunta de un país crucial para entender esta región que llamamos América. Ninguna área de México debe escapar del trabajo de Dr. Class, desde las raíces antiguas de la nación a los tremendos desafíos sociales y políticos actuales, pasando por las artes, la ciencia y la tecnología. 
Hoy el profesor Mato se une a nosotros desde la Ciudad de México para presentar al reconocido escritor Juan Villoro, que es el conferencista Eduardo Matos Moctezuma del otoño de 2020. Por favor, demos un caloroso bienvenida en espacio y tiempo virtual al maestro Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. Bueno, es un gran placer estar hoy aquí con ustedes en esta nueva plática acerca de la Cátedra Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. Realmente es un esfuerzo muy grande eh, de colaboración entre eh, México y Harvard y creo que ha dado frutos eh, muy relevantes. Y me toca hoy presentar a uno de los escritores más prolíficos con que cuenta México, y me refiero a Juan Villoro. Juan Villoro nació en 1956 y desde joven ya tenía interés en los aspectos literarios. Empezó pues a escribir desde temprana edad y algo insólito empezó también a temprana edad a recolectar premios. Y tenemos que Juan ha eh, participado o ha escrito en los diferentes aspectos literarios. Por ejemplo, Juan es un gran ensayista, es un gran novelista, escribe cuentos, escribe teatro y además nos da sus colaboraciones en periódicos diversos en los que además ejerce no solo el aspecto periodístico, sino que sus trabajos, sus artículos están eh, de acuerdo con lo que se está viviendo. Es decir, que es un crítico fuerte, severo, de la eh, realidad del país y del mundo. Entonces, como ustedes pueden ver, pues Juan tiene una eh, eh, múltiple, unas múltiples facetas en las cuales desarrolla, además con una pluma privilegiada, todos sus eh, escritos. Eh, vale la pena mencionar cómo Juan además ha recibido diversos eh, premios. Eh, actualmente tiene cerca de una veintena de premios recibidos no solo en México, sino también en otros países. Y eso indica cómo la presencia de Juan en el mundo literario es realmente impresionante. Eh, además, ha sido invitado a dar conferencias, a dar cursos en, en muchas eh, universidades, centros de estudios, instituciones, y para que ustedes se den una idea de eh, algunos de los lugares a los que él ha eh, asistido, me permito leer lo siguiente. Por ejemplo, ha dado cursos, obviamente, en la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, en Boston University, en la Universidad Pompeu Fabra de Barcelona, en la Universidad de Princeton, y también conferencias en la Universidad de Tokio, en la Sorbona de París, en Princeton también, Brown, la Sapienza de Roma, Bolonia, Lobaina, Dartmouth College, la Complutense de Madrid, la Central y la Autónoma de Barcelona, Rowen, Cambridge, Oxford, Essex y muchas más en las que se ha dejado escuchar su voz sobre además temas diferentes, como un caso curioso, debemos señalar que Juan Villoro, además 
es un apasionado del fútbol. Él ha escrito libros, inclusive, eh, que han sido premiados eh, sobre el tema del fútbol. Y también quiero comentar cómo en, eh, hace algunos años Juan ingresó a el Colegio Nacional. El Colegio Nacional es una institución que eh, tiene a los 40 más connotados investigadores en diferentes ramas. Entonces Juan ingresó al colegio en la rama de arte, de literatura, y me pidió que yo diera respuesta a su eh, participación inicial. Él presentó en esa ocasión históricas pequeñeces dedicadas a un gran poeta mexicano como lo es López Velarde. Eh, realmente fue un placer escuchar en eh, propia voz de Juan todas sus apreciaciones acerca de lo que implicaba la presencia de López Velarde en las letras mexicanas. Eh, no quiero extenderme más, creo que lo que he dicho da una idea de la persona que hoy tiene a su cargo la, eh, la cátedra Eduardo Matos Moctezuma y creo que vamos a disfrutar de sus palabras. Muchas gracias. Hello, I'm very happy to be here and to deliver this talk in the Eduardo Moctezuma lectures. Uh, I'm, I want uh, to thank uh, David Carrasco, Mauricio Benitez, everybody involved with the uh, uh, Matos Moctezuma lecture uh, at Harvard. And especially, I, I would like to thank uh, Erin Goodman for her wonderful rendition of my text uh, in English. Thank you all for being there. The Obsidian Mirror, Archaeology and Literature. In 1790, the effigy of the Aztec goddess Cuatlicue was discovered by accident in Mexico City. The huge stone block on which snakes and skulls had been engraved both captivated and horrified those who saw it. It was taken to the city's university where it was exhibited for a short time. The authorities of New Spain feared that its presence would reactivate the ancient fate of the indigenous people. The impact of this aesthetic and religious expression from the pre-Hispanic world caused uh, was akin to terror. The goddess was laid to rest once again. In 1804, during his stay in Mexico City, Alexander von Humboldt, who had read about the Cuatlicue, requested permission to see the statue. For a few days, she returned to the surface of the earth. It was only in the 19th century that her disconcerting figure became an object of study and gradually admiration. Octavio Paz wrote in 1977, and I quote, the changing fortunes of the Cuatlicue from goddess to demon, from demon to monster, and from monster to masterpiece illustrate the changes in our sensibility over the last 400 years, end of quote. The image of the deity that emerges from the past to disturb the present summarizes our dealings with the cultures of origin. News from that radically earlier time have been received with astonishment and horror. Direct access to the indigenous mentality was broken during the conquista. After most of the codices were destroyed and the temples burned down, some enlightened friars suddenly turned anthropologists 
try to restore this legacy, but they could only do so in a hybrid and fragmented way, blending their informant's input with their own conception of reality. The ancient civilizations of Mesoamerica were subjected to hypotheses and conjectures that were not always verifiable, as well as to esoteric interpretations, shaping an hermetic discourse, the decisive keys to which had been lost. However, in a sometimes vague way, the, that past was inherent to our makeup. An independent Mexico could not be explained without the myths and legends, the plants and animals, the culinary dishes and the use of colors, words and customs that came from a mysterious previous era. Mexican national identity was created from that dark matter. Is it possible to recognize oneself in something one doesn't know? In 1992, in his book, The Buried Mirror, Carlos Fuentes took up ideas that Octavio Paz had put forth since 1950 in The Labyrinth of Solitude. Fuentes eloquently associates Mexican conflicted identity with the legend of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent at the heart of several Mesoamerican theodicies. An enlightened god, Quetzalcoatl, lived for knowledge, but he didn't know his own face. That shortcoming gave rise to a curious divine dispute. The pre-Hispanic sky was a stage for gods in conflict. Tezcatlipoca, Lord of Fatality had a smoking obsidian mirror. Whoever looked into it would gaze upon their unchangeable destiny. To defeat Quetzalcoatl, Tezcatlipoca forced him to look at his own face. On the polished obsidian surface, that uh, harmony seeking God beheld an aberration, a confusing creature part bird and part reptile. Horrified uh, at his own image, he threw down the mirror and fled from the people who had venerated him. The mirror was buried like a time capsule, waiting to acquire another meaning. Carlos Fuentes used this legend to express the drama that ensues when we confront ourselves. We will only be worthy of our identity when we accept the contradictory features that characterize us. As Octavio Paz expressed in The Labyrinth of Solitude and later in Postdata, this exercise is not intended to separate Mexicans from others, making them exceptional or unique. On the contrary, overcoming the complex of being different allows us to establish a dialogue of plurality with other cultures, equity among differences. Just as the sight of the Coatlicue produced uncomfortable astonishment, so did Tezcatlipoca's mirror. This fear came less from the objects themselves than from the way they were seen. Consequently, we opted for the reassuring remedy of hiding them, the obsidian disc and the incomprehensible idols were buried. Archaeologists would bring them back. The British writer D.H. Lawrence traveled to Mexico in 1923 when several effigies were excavated. This confirmed his theory that telluric and religious forces were returning to amend a reality that the West had vulgarized. In 1926, three years later, he published the novel The Plumped Serpent, more interesting as theosophical speculation than as literature. Two years earlier, Mexican writer 
eh, José Juan Tablada had published passages from a similar novel in the newspaper El Universal, calling it The Resurrection of Idols. It's possible that D. H. Lawrence had read those excerpts, but what's certain is that an atmosphere of archaeological recovery was in the air. In his book, Historia de la Arqueología del México Antiguo, History of the Archaeology of Ancient Mexico, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma points to the importance of the Mexican Revolution to understand our pre-Hispanic cultural heritage differently. After the armed struggle from 1910 to 1920, important archaeological recovery efforts were carried out, largely uh, guided by uh, Manuel Gamio. In addition to continuing the work, the work at sites such as Teotihuacan, which had been explored since the 17th century by the scientist and writer Carlos de Sigüenza y Góngora, excavations were made at Copilco and Cuicuilco, making Mexico City the scene of discovery. The streets that D. H. Lawrence and Jose Juan Tablada strolled extended over an underground scene that was beginning to emerge. The effigies made of stone inscribed in mineral time were in no rush to communicate their messages. Little by little, such messages would come to us. In 1978, a decisive discovery was made in an emblematic place in the Mexican capital, just uh, at the downtown of Mexico City, at the centers of centers. The remains of the Aztec Templo Mayor returned to the surface. Eduardo Matos Moctezuma led those efforts and he continues to head the urban archaeological prom program to this day. On several occasions, he has referred to that moment when archaeologists of any era make a discovery. A flashlight illuminates the past. That light had been instrumental in rebuilding the cultural mosaic that we depend on, often without knowing it. While the archaeologists of the 20th century were uncovering the lost language of stones, Literature imagined links with a culture that had been doomed to be lost in the haze of time. In his book, Octavio Paz y la Arqueología, Matos Moctezuma wrote, archaeologists penetrate the arcana of the past via the time magic that is archaeology. Poets achieve this too by passing through the tenuous curtain separating the living from the dead to get closer to the window of time. My generation began publishing in the 1970s and became interested in the indigenous world thanks to archaeological discovery, but also thanks to the stimuli from an unexpected source, counterculture. Fernando Benitez's uh, chronicle the hallucinogenic mushrooms was essential for a vernacular tradition embodied in the figure of the modern day Mazatec uh, priestess Maria Sabina to reach the age of Aquarius. The same can be said of Carlos Castaneda's The Teachings of Don Juan, a Jackie way of knowledge, a research project that was originally conceived as an anthropology thesis on a yaqui shaman, which became the magical tome of middle-class um, youth seeking an alternate reality. During his time in Mexico, uh, Aldous Huxley introduced uh, Timothy Leary to mind-blowing mushrooms. A doctor of psychology at uh, Harvard University Timothy Leary researched the possibilities of expanding consciousness through the regulated use of narcotics. In the early 60s, he became the ultimate LSD prophet. 
expelled from the university circuit, he took refuge at the Hotel Catalina in Cihuatanejo, where he founded a kind of club med of the mind. In the summers of 1962 and 1963, Leary and some other uh, theory persons gathered in the Mexican coastal village of Cihuatanejo to open the doors of perception. Carlos Castaneda was possibly part of that group, as was a CIA agent who denounced the experiments to the authorities in Mexico and the United States. Cihuatanejo was the world headquarters for the expansion of consciousness. Under pressure from the United States, the Mexican government asked Leary to leave the country. In his interview with the authorities, the acid guru warned about the dangers of prohibitionism and proposed that Mexico become a psychedelic Switzerland, administering recreational drugs according to medical and cultural criteria. A Pandora's box had been opened, leading to one dilemma. Either a low control use of hallucinogens in the way that the original peoples of Mexico have lived with endemic plants for centuries, or let organized crime run rampant. We know the outcome. More than half a century later, Mexico is bleeding to death in a futile war against drug trafficking. It's worth emphasizing that counterculture lent the past an unusual novelty. Until then, our schooling had referred to pre-Hispanic grandeur as something unalterable and in the past, thanks to the heralds of psychedelia, from beat writers to rock poets, India, China, Peru, and Mexico were seen as reservoirs of transcendental wisdom capable of altering the present. Counterculture popularized discussions that uh, decades earlier only had taken place in high uh, culture circles. In 1939, the critic and editor Philip Raw published an essay in uh, the Kenyan Review who would spark literary discussion in the United States. The appealing title of the text was Pale Face and Redskin. Raw divided the writers of his country between the quote, pale faces, whom in the manner of Henry James sought elegant interior spaces, and the quote, redskins, who in the manner of Herman Melville preferred the uncertainties of the outdoors. The former respected classical forms. They used saddle like cowboys. The latter were iconoclasts who rode bareback. Without saying it openly, in this uh, classification, Raw preferred the Redskins. Cherokees, Comanches, and Apaches acquired the prestige of cultural transgressors. Without taking full account of the Indians who served him as metaphor, Raw brought them into the discussion like a noisy cavalcade. Mexico has been fertile ground for outcast, the reskined writers of the American tradition from Langston Hughes and Hart Crane to Jack Kerouac and William S. Burroughs and Ken Kesey, who, uh, by the way, was a fundamental figure of psychedelia, psychedelia. The path to ourselves is through others, Octavio Paz pointed out when speaking of the influence of African art on Picasso's Cubist period. To return to the point of departure, we must take a detour. In the 1960s and 70s, counterculture lent the indigenous legacy a sense of modernity. Those who studied anthropology or archaeology 
at that time, delved into the systematic study of origin cultures. Meanwhile, artists search for intuitive contacts in this lush bazaar of symbols. Jose Agustin, the main narrator of Mexican counter uh, culture, renamed in my country as La Onda, began his career as a disciple of uh, J.D. Salinger. After approaching existentialism, surrealism, Carl Jung's uh, theories of the collective unconscious, and the New Age philosophy of Alan Watts, Jose Agustin studied Nahuatl and rediscovered the messages of ancient Mexico in novels such as Near the Fire. Counterculture revealed that the past could be pop, uh, which produced all kinds of distortions and over-analysis. Carlos Monsiváis left us an ironic aphorism about the way that Zeitkodilia perceived uh, mythical figures. I quote Monsiváis, Cuatlicue no longer speaks because she is passed out. The will to be, quote, red-skinned, did not necessarily assume the study of native peoples. Taking on a savage condition became a generalized intellectual stance that years later would shape the best known novel about that period, The Savage Detectives by Roberto Bolaño. My first book, La Noche Navegable, Waterway Night, is a compilation of stories written in the 1970s. The story that gives it its title takes place in the archaeological zone of Monte Albán in the state of Oaxaca. The plot is about some friends who get trapped uh, in that uh, site and must spend there the night. In this story of love, friendship and possible betrayal, the most significant element is the context. The characters act differently, magnetized by a unknown force emanating from the ruins, an unconscious stimulus to which they naively subject themselves. In Waterway Night, the idea of historical legacy is remote and esoteric. A decade later, in 1989, I published a travel book about uh, Yucatan. Throughout my journey, I was amazed that the first inhabitants of the peninsula were seen as extratemporal beings. I quote from that book, in Merida, anything could be thought about the Maya, except that they are alive. The city expresses its pride in the pyramids to the extent that they are historical legacy. The Maya are not spoken in the present tense. Anything outside, the green, the jungle, the sisal agave plants, is the world of the peasants, the Indians, the others. Five years later, on January 1st, 1994, the Zapatista National Liberation Army took up arms in Chiapas to protest the implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. While one sector of the country dreamed of acquiring consumer goods for the so-called uh, first world, another lived a nightmare of backwardness and oblivion. The Zapatista movement took up unfulfilled ideals of the Mexican revolution, such as the inclusion of the dispossessed people in the national project, the communal recovery of the land, the struggle for a direct and non-representative democracy. The movement put the indigenous issue on the agenda of modernity, showing that this struggle did not only belong to the past, but to the present. Eduardo Matos Moctezuma agrees with Octavio Paz that the National Museum of Anthropology and History was conceived in Mexico City as a temple whose main altar is presided over by two Aztec pieces, the great Cuatlicue and the Piedra de Sol. Uh, 
or sunstone. This museological sacralization helped the post-revolutionary administrations to proudly celebrate pre-Hispanic relics while ignoring the commitment of Emiliano Zapata and the reality of indigenous peoples. Starting in 1994, the Zapatistas and the indigenous movements that joined them or initiated complementary struggles revealed the surprising novelty of the past. Its effect was political, but also intellectual, as it prompted the present to be understood through the lens of codes from another era. A few months after the uprising, I wrote a chronicle about the Mexico City subway. In line with public debate at the time, the underworld seemed to me a modern representation of the cave of origin, common to most pre-Hispanic cosmogonies, and of Mictlan, the subterranean destiny of the dead. In the subway, as in the Zapatista discourse, an atavistic heritage coexists with postmodern symbols. When the first subway line opened in 1979, it boasted the most modern technology available imported from France. On the other hand, many stations had Nahua names and the style that imitated pre-Columbian friezes, the icons that turned cartography into a pictographic codex, and the pyramid found at the Pino Suarez station were signs of an unusual pre-Hispanic modernity. In 1994, this clash of symbols gave rise to the text, the city is uh, the sky of the subway, included years later in my book, Horizontal Vertigo. I mentioned this uh, personal itinerary because it accounts for the different ways in which the indigenous past has been viewed by my generation. The trajectory that began with the 1980 tale Waterway Night up to the 1994 chronicle about the subway bears witness to a shift. The indigenous world ceases to be a spellbound and inscrutable backdrop and becomes an explanation of the present. Stone words, las palabras de las piedras. The dialogue between Mexican literature and archeology span has had several stopovers. I'll consider a few here. The story Chuck Mole, published by Carlos Fuentes in 1954 in his first book, The Masked Days, is about a statue of a Toltec and Mayan god, Chacmol, that alters contemporary life. The pre-Hispanic world returns in the form of a threat. The narrator inherits the statue from Filiberto, a friend who drowns in Acapulco and leaves a diary about a disturbing effigy that comes to life when it makes contact with water. The narrator claims Filiberto's corpse and takes it back to his house, where a disgusting looking yellow Indian opens the door for him and asks him to take the corpse to the basement, the underground environment to which relics are often relegated. The ritual comes full circle. The friend who has died from the influence of the water dominating God will occupy the place held by the statue. In this short story, the vision of the past is ambivalent. The ancient world has been solid, but contact with it is terrible. Chuck Moll returns seeking revenge. Ten years later, in 1964, Elena Garro conceived an exceptional story, La Culpa es de los Tlaxcaltecas, 
blame the classical text, included in her book, The Week of Colors. As we know, the conquest of Mexico was possible, among other reasons, because the classical text joined joins the Spaniards to fight the Aztecs, who had cruelly subjected them. Since then, the word classical tech has been unfairly associated with traitor. In Elena Garro's story, this legendary culpability extends to women that a machista and patriarchal tradition has warped into mistrustful and irrational figures. The plot links two time periods, Laura's domestic life in the 20th century and the pre-Hispanic world where she has an affair. One sentence defines the logic of the text. Everything incredible is true. Todo lo increíble es verdadero. Laura is married to Pablo, a decent average man. On a bridge linking the two realities, she meets a wounded indigenous man who survived the, the conquista and, and whom she calls cousin husband. When she feels the warrior's blood on her body, she thinks that they are one being. In contrast, she finds her husband boring and controlling someone who spoke not in words, but in letters. Laura loves the warrior without this being a dis disloyalty, because her passion is consummated in another era to which only she has access. However, she is marked by the stigma of her gender. In the present, the comfortable yet tedious universe where she has a maid and electric appliances, her affair with her cousin husband represent an incestuous transgression, alien to the discriminatory privileges of her class. Her lover is dangerous, an Indian willing to kidnap a white woman. He tells her, you were a traitor when I met you, and that is how I loved you. Stigmatized in her own era by the fact of being a, woo, a, whim, a woman, Laura is unconditionally accepted in the warrior's time out of time. In Carlos Fuentes' short story, Chuck Mall, the past appears as a fascinating and destructive force. In Elena Garro's story, Blame the Classical Text, the past is represented in the risky option of loving the indigenous rather than a condemnation, it's a liberation. It would take many years for Elena Garro's pioneering gaze to be seen as more than fantasy literature. In 1972, some years later, Jose Emilio Pacheco wrote his own version of this encounter with the past in The Bullfight, La Fiesta Brava, a story from the book El Principio del Placer, The Pleasure Principle. Pacheco conceived a suggestive story within a story. The main character, Andres Quintana, is a failed writer who has the opportunity to collaborate in an American magazine printed in Mexico and submits an interested, interesting but unsuccessful piece called The Bullfight, featuring Captain Keller, a Vietnam veteran visiting Mexico. Again, the effigy of the Cuatlique is both attractive and bewildering. Every day, Captain Keller goes to the Museum of Anthropology to sketch the statue of the Aztec goddess. His obsessive interest in the ancient world brings the former soldier into contact with secret emissaries from that culture and, finally, with the sacrificial stone. Quintana delivers his story and the editor dismisses it, 
He reminds Quintana that Carlos Fuentes had already exhausted that topic and that Julio Cortázar blended the present with the Aztec world in his tale, The Night Faced Up. Um, this story by Cortázar depicts a tragic ending as well as uh, Andres Quintana's story. On the top of that, the narrative's condemnation of the US imperialism and the Vietnam War seems to the editor not only demagogic, but also cynical. How could Quintana write an anti-Yankee story for a magazine financed by the United States? Quintana's poorly written piece serves as the source material for Jose Emilio Pacheco's accomplished story. Although the editor's criticism is directed at the tale, it is suggested that he also take revenge on a personal level since Quintana married the woman the editor loved. In the rejected story, bearing the same title as Pacheco's, time crossing is used for dramatic effect and the Aztec world appears supernatural, incomprehensible and punitive. Anyone who disturbs the slumber of that myth deserves to die. The ritual of human sacrifice appears as a settling of accounts far from its, uh, its authentic religious meaning of staving off an adverse ecosystem dominated by droughts, plagues, and uh, floods by offering up what's most precious, human life. In the words of Octavio Paz, sacrifice did not bring about salvation in another world, but cosmic health. By placing an unpublishable story within his own story, Pacheco indirectly criticizes those who have caricatured the pre-Hispanic legacy as a crypt of symbols that enables the conceiving of special effects. By saying that Carlos Fuentes had already exhausted the subject, perhaps the editor also suggests that Fuentes had gone down a dead end, inventing a past that never existed and arbitrarily associating it with the present. Andres Quintana, who is fed up of living off uh, his work as English-Spanish translator, becomes interested in the conquista out of political rather than literary seal because he wants to write an attention-grabbing parable about Vietnam in an interesting and perhaps contradictory manner, Pacheco criticizes this transposition of imperialisms, but makes Quintana suffer the same fate as his character, Captain Keller, suggesting at the end of his own tale that the vengeful forces of the Aztecs continue to operate underground. If narrative has focused on combining and confronting the different eras of Mexican history, poetry has sought uh, to capture singular moments that are capable of revealing that what happened yesterday is still happening today, like the flower in Samuel Taylor Coleridge poem, What If You Sleep, I quote the wonderful in poem by Coleridge. What if you slept and what if in your sleep you dreamed and what if in your dream you went to heaven and there plucked a strange and beautiful flower and what if when you awoke you had that flower in your hand? Ah, what then? This wonderful poem deals with a uh, the mysterious way the past uh, has to become part of the present. That's what Mexican poetry has intended while regarding the ancient pre-Hispanic past. In 2004, two anthologies were 
devoted to the relationship of modern poets with the pre-Hispanic legacy. El Corazón Prestado, The Borrowed Heart by Victor Manuel Mendiola, and Un Pasado Visible, A Visible Past by Gustavo Jiménez Aguirre. It's difficult to imagine what that approach would have been without the passionate reflections of Octavio Paz, a dominant figure among Mexican intellectuals during the second half of the 20th century. In addition to his luminous essays on art and the conception of the ancient world, in 1957, Octavio Paz dedicated his greatest poem to the Aztec calendar, Piedra de Sol, Sunstone a poem that includes 584 hendecasyllables. The verses add up to complete a cycle, the knotting of uh, the years that governs Aztec time. A multi-layered poem about love, eroticism, nature, the condition of the individual before the vicissitudes of history and the incessant flow of time Sunstone is also a search for identity. The self is a lost being that can only recognize himself in others, all the others that we are. Los otros todos que nosotros somos. The poem begins and ends with the same verses, imitating the circular flow of the myth. Eduardo Matos Moctezuma notices in the poem a recreation of the Aztec mentality marked by complementary forces of creation and destruction, a dialectical conception of the universe that is expressed through duality and constant change. While Octavio Paz forged decisive pathways in the modern discussion of the past, the main link with indigenous writings was Nezahualcoyotl, a 15th century poet who ruled Texcoco for 40 years. About 30 of his poems survive. Those words are a portal that does not exhaust its mysteries, a threshold that seems to vanish as we cross it. Is the unprecedented modernity of his ideas true to what he thought, or has it been reformulated by the whims of his translators and interpreters? We can only guess. The historian Miguel Leon Portilla considers Nezahualcoyotl the first humanist of the New World an enlightened, uh, hedonistic, peaceful ruler in an environment of sacred world warfare, the poet king adored nature. He erected a temple to the god of war with Silopochtli in recognition of the Aztec hegemony, but across from it, he raised another effigy in honor to Tloque Nahuake, the unknown God, Lord of the near and the night, a being without face nor figure represented by crossbars symbolizing the floors of heaven. This invisible metaphysical deity pays tribute to the ineffable. In his verses, Nezahualcoyotl, traverses all the registers of the Nahua tradition of flower and song. If human sacrifices were accepted as a sacred tribute imposed by the priest rulers, poetry was their rebellious other side. In a context accustomed to offering life to quench the thirst of the gods, Nezahualcoyotl asks, do we really live rooted in the earth? Adding sadly, like a painting, we will fade away. In frank opposition to this destiny, he proclaims, there where death does not exist, there 
where she is conquered, there I go. The poet king conceives Tloke Nawake, the unknown god, as an author who traces the codex of human life. I quote Netzahualcoyot, with songs you give shade to those who must live on earth and remedies it like a perpetual eraser with blank ink you will blot out all that was brotherhood. Netzahualcoyotl deciphers enigmas while he is deciphered by a god. Centuries later, Octavio Paz would say, I too am written. At this very moment, someone spells me out. In his book, Tríptico de la Muerte, Matos Moctezuma includes a selection of Nahua poetry translated by Ángel María Garibay that provides a sound echo to Netzahualcoyotl's verses. Matos wrote, ideology conditions the places where dead individuals will go and reverses the best fate for the warriors who are necessary for the survival of Tenochtitlan. End of quote. However, poetry does not uh, fully conform to that fate. In a severely guarded environment, subjected to strict religious domination, the anonymous authors protest against their fleeting passage on earth. I quote from that poetry, anyone who prays to God jeopardizes his destiny by surrendering it. The lament continues in several poems. I cry, I grieve when I remember that we will leave behind beautiful flowers, beautiful songs. We must leave the earth that endures. To oblivion and vapor, I must surrender myself. Human life, inherently brief, was exposed to the obsidian edge that extracted hearts on the stone of sacrifices. The poems of flower and songs are the result of an intellectual uprising. They don't meekly accept the idea that dead warriors accompany the sun or console themselves by thinking of underworld's abodes. They question the mandate of dying and they celebrate nature as the supreme form of life. Netzahualcoyotl challenge the transcendence of all things through words. My flowers will not wilt. My songs will not cease. Carlos Pellicer, a Catholic poet who was passionate about archaeology, created the museum at La Venta, Tabasco, to safeguard Olmec culture. The space itself defined <clears throat> its content, an enclosure made of wood and plants in dialogue with the surrounding flora. It's not a coincidence that Pellicer dedicated an extensive poem to Netzahualcoyotl focused on his sensual dealings with the biosphere. I quote Pellicer, there were many flowers on his body. The unknown God was only for him. Vast intimacy out in the open, the whole voice alone, the electric voice in the wasteland of any midnight loneliness, the spherical realm of revelations, the healthy terror of being alive before God. Amidst the disorders of intelligence, the inevitable result of progress, Pellicer sought the flowers that still sprout among the ancient stones of the pyramids, like messages from Netzahualcoyotl. In today's pandemic times, one verse is strikingly relevant 
the healthy terror of being alive. Global warming and the acceleration of ecocide give renewed importance both to the poetry of the poet king of Texcoco, Nezahualcoyotl, and to Carlos Pellicer's interpretation of him. Poems that seek to capture the essence of archaeological sites abound. Efraín Bartolomé visited Tonina, José Emilio Pacheco visited Tulum, Jaime García Terres visited Yaxilan, Efraín Huerta visited Tajín. José Carlos Becerra said of those places that nothing rests but everything sleeps. The stones speak through the language of dreams. Among the poets who have touched on the mystery of the sleeping stones, Rubén Bonifaz Nuño stands out. Bonifaz Nuño was a connoisseur of pre-Hispanic culture and dedicated several essays to the topic. In his poetry, he sought an original entree to that universe. Bonifaz Nuño avoids the obvious allusions to the past. He doesn't mention, for example, heroes, archaeological sites, or deities. He seeks uh, an intimate, everyday understanding, a contact with other nets, which is strangely natural. In the present, the poet takes ownership of the aesthetics of that era, with an economy of re resources equivalent to that of the flower and song tradition, he covers the same issues, the fleetingness of life, the feeling of being on borrowed land, and the intimate rebellion against that fate. But he lends them the tone and cadence of modern poetry. I quote Ruben Bonifaz Nuño. Friends, it was true, we never have anything forever. By willing the next day to dawn, we seek death. We gaze at each other for an instant in the flowery encounter of faces, and we are thrown out of the party always too early and without a fix. Because everything is borrowed, our houses are borrowed, and our awakenings, our company. Let nobody call on me at this hour, when perhaps you will be expecting me. Bonifaz Nuño wrote novel poems with an ancestral substratum. The essential themes of Nahuatl poetry are present. The destiny that cannot be escaped, the transience of all things, the moment that is treasured like a flower sprouting. But they are recover with the simplicity of contemporary language. The distant acquires intimacy. Bonifaz Nuño adds the second person singular, tu, to the tradition of flor y canto, flower and song. The poet isn't speaking to someone far away emerging across centuries, but to someone who could be by his side. I quote him. Let nobody call on me at this hour when perhaps you will be expecting me. This method of composition is reminiscent of one of the most disputed questions in archaeology, whether to reconstruct or consolidate discoveries. For a long time, the idea of rebuilding the pyramids prevailed, which was done in Teotihuacan and Cholula, with a sense of humor, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma has pointed out that this practice reveals the Toltec influence, not that of the inhabitants of the archaeological site of Tula, but that of a Mexican cement company called Cementos Tolteca. Counter to this idea of our architecturally reconstructing the past, Matos proposed an archaeological an archaeology that not only preserves the stones but also their historicity, that is, the state in which they were found. This stance 
reach a critical moment with the discovery of the Templo Mayor in 1978. The architect Pedro Ramirez Vázquez, a creator of the National Museum of Anthropology, proposed the recreation of the dual temple of the Aztecs. President José López Portillo, who had written a book on Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, and felt, uh, felt like a modern Aztec emperor, listened sympathetically uh, to the architect uh, Ramírez Vázquez. But Matos Moctezuma sidestepped the nonsense on turning the historic site into a theme park, arguing that the discovery should honor a bygone culture, but should also show how had it been destroyed by consolidating rather than reconstructing findings, archaeology allows us to observe various layers of time. Rather than artificially restoring the former appearances of buildings, they are recovered without disguising the wounds of time. Boniface Nuno's poetry, in similar fashion, recovers the past through everyday words that are accessible to the contemporary reader, he opens a window to a remote zone of time. What he communicates is both archaic and recent. A broken world can be seen naturally from the present, which hasn't stopped resembling its previous iteration and which will perhaps suffer the same fate. The poet speaks of the borrowed heart that the humans carry and of which they are never entirely the, the owners. This dilemma could easily refer to a warrior on the sacrificial stone or to any of us subject to the tribulations of feelings. What fate has uh, poetry found in the more than 60 native languages spoken in Mexico? The restitution of the voices of the flower and song owes much to the work of Father Angel Maria Garibay, who also translated from classical Greek and Hebrew. At the end of the 20th century, this toil of recovery found a notable follower in Carlos Montemayor, who had also been trained in classical uh, languages. After the Zapatista rebellion, Montemayor's uh, academic seal took on political significance. His interest in vernacular languages spread to those who express their emotions in those languages today. Departing from his archival research, he created new literary workshops and dead languages were resurrected in several anthologies. Despite contributions such as Montemayor's, uh, Mexico continues to discriminate against native languages, several of which are in danger of extinction. Poet and essayist Gabriel Said points out a dramatic example. The Papai community, a Baja California people that has raised remarkable poetic sons to the sun, had only 216 members in the year uh, 2015. 216 members. They are under peer, uh, peril of extinction. Although there are well-known Nahua authors such as Natalio Hernandez and Mardonio Carvalho and Zapotecs such as Irma Pineda and Natalia Toledo, there is still a long way to go for that universe to occupy the place it deserves in our culture. Victor de la Cruz Perez, a poet from Juchitan, Oaxaca, born in 1948, knows that his voice could fall into an abyss in the poem, <clears throat> Who Are We? What is Our Name? He ponders the meaning of writing in an imposed, radically distant environment. 
his verses strike with the force of what shouldn't be there and yet those appear. Who to talk to and what to say when there's no one home and the creeks and the crickets are all I hear? If I say yes, if I say no, to whom do I say yes? To whom do I say no? Where did they come from? This no and this yes. And whom do I address in this darkness? Who put these words to paper? Why do we write on paper and not on the earth? Contemporary poetry in vernacular languages is practiced in a threaded realm where to write is to safeguard. Juventino Gutierrez Gómez, a Mije poet from Tlahuitoltepec, Oaxaca, born in 1985, described this task in a poem that bears the eloquent title Guarida, Liar. When the animals gather up their vocal cords from the trees, from the rooftops, from the cornfields, they are safeguarding my language. The obsidian mirror in which Quetzalcoatl saw herself still has duties to fulfill. These notes written to recreate the dialogue between archaeology and literature and to pay tribute to one of the greatest champions of that conversation, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, attempt to show that the ancient world, which for centuries has been seen as something that's, that had uh, passed and was shuttered, remains open. Time is not stationary. Through archaeology, the ori origin stones return to us. Through literature, they speak to us again. 2021 will mark 500 years since the fall of Tenochtitlan. The challenge of inclusion continues to be a pending issue in Mexico's unequal society. In his own literary sunstone, Octavio Paz alludes to a yet future community, all the others that we are, los otros todos que nosotros somos. Our perception of ourselves depends on what is other, to the same extent that the future is nourished by another era. The future of the past is yet to come. Thank you very much. I said at the beginning that the goal of this lecture series was to honor a Mexican scholar whose contributions had a universal value to the world, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. Today we have heard from another Mexican intellectual whose contributions are now reaching many corners of the world because of his excellence. So I end with a series of thank yous. Thank you to Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. Thank you to Juan Dioro, to Steve Levitsky at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. We wish him well in his new leadership. Thank you to Mauricio Benitez, to Divinity School Dean David Hempton, and especially to Jose Antonio Alonso Espinosa and his wife Karen Beckman for their support. I thank Charlene Higby at the Moses Mesoamerican Archive. I thank Jane Pickering at the Peabody Museum and Diana Moon Xochitl also at the Peabody Museum and Chicano artist George Yepes. But most of all, I thank all of you for attending virtually this marvelous presentation by Juan Villoro. And we look forward to our next encounter with the name of Eduardo Matos Moctezuma and the lecturer 
who will engage Harvard and Mexico and give them new knowledge of our collaboration and the cultural wonders that make up Mexico today. Thank you very much. <laughs>